Hello and welcome to the BE iLab channel. We are excited to have you join us as we explore the world of geospatial science and learn about advanced data analysis techniques. In today's video, we'll be exploring the crucial steps involved in preparing data for land use and land cover classification using machine learning algorithms. Get ready to embark on this informative journey with us. To begin our mission, let's talk about the dataset. The dataset consists of Sentinel-2 satellite image data with four 10-meter bands, including red, green, blue, and NIR as the input. This image was collected from Gibraltar, which is a British overseas territory located on the southern end of the Iberian Peninsula. The ground truth data is pixel-based labels, and each pixel has its label. The land cover classes within this area consist of shrubland, grassland, cropland, built-up, bare or sparse vegetation, snow or ice, and permanent water bodies. Now that we've set the stage and introduced our dataset, let's dive into the implementation process. Our journey begins with the installation of the Rasterio Library, a crucial tool for working with geospatial raster data. This library will facilitate the loading and manipulation of Sentinel-2 satellite images. Moving on to Cell-2, we import essential Python libraries such as NumPy for numerical operations, Rasterio for geospatial data handling, Matplotlib for plotting, Random for generating random values, and Scikit-learn for pre-processing tasks. Starting with the first lines of code, we load our Sentinel-2 satellite image using Rasterio. The variable Sentinel underscore data now holds a Rasterio dataset object, and Sentinel underscore bands contains the actual image data. This dataset includes bands capturing information in the red, green, blue, and near-infrared spectra. Moving on, we load the corresponding ground truth data similar to the Sentine 2 data. Our ground truth data is a two-dimensional array with one band. This data will be used for training and evaluating our machine learning model. Next, we extract and print information about the dimensions of the Sentinel-2 image. We use the dot shape attribute to retrieve the number of bands, rows, and columns in our Sentinel-2 image. This print statement provides us with a quick overview of the data shape. Then, we print additional information about the Sentinel-2 image, including the number of bands and spatial resolution. Lastly, we print the shape of the ground truth data. Now, let's visualize our Sentinel-2 image and the corresponding ground truth labels using Matplotlib. First, we set up a figure with a size of 12 by 6 inches to ensure a clear and comprehensive display. Next, we iterate through each band of the Sentinel-2 image, creating subplots for each. The images are displayed using the mshow function, and we've chosen the Voridus color map for clarity. You can customize the color map based on your preferences. Following the Sentinel-2 bands, we plot the ground truth data in the last subplot. Each land cover class is represented by a distinct color, thanks to the tab 10 color map. Finally, we adjusted the layout for better visualization and display of the plot. This visual representation offers a valuable glimpse into the spectral characteristics of each band and the distribution of land cover classes across the image. Now that we've visualized our data, the next crucial step is data pre-processing. In this section of the code, we're extracting spectral data and corresponding labels. We initialize empty lists, input underscore list and label underscore list to store our input data and labels, respectively. Iterating through each pixel in the image, we extract the spectral data for the current pixel from all bands of the Sentinel-2 image. Additionally, we extract the corresponding label for that pixel from the ground truth data. To ensure the data is meaningful, we check if the pixel has a valid label greater than zero and if the spectral data contains non-zero values. If both conditions are met, we append the data and label to our lists. Finally, we print the number of valid inputs and labels, providing insights into the quality and quantity of our training data. Now that we have our extracted data and labels, it's time to prepare our input arrays. Firstly, we calculate the total number of pixels, which is the length of our input underscore list. This gives us the total amount of data we'll be working with. Next, we initialize two arrays, X and Y, to store our input data and corresponding labels, respectively. X has a shape of the total number of pixels and bands, and Y has a shape of the total number of pixels. 
We then fill these arrays with data from our input underscore list and label underscore list, completing the process of preparing our data for the machine learning model. Finally, we print the shapes of our input data and labels, confirming the dimensions before we proceed with training our model. As we move forward, it's essential to ensure our data is well prepared for training. In this code snippet, we focus on shuffling and selecting our training data. We set the number of training data points to 100,000, adjusting it based on our requirements. Next, we generate an array of indices using the np.arrangex.shape0. These indices represent the positions of our data points. We then shuffle these indices randomly to introduce variability in our training set. Subsequently, we shuffle our input data and labels accordingly to maintain the correspondence between data and labels. Finally, we select the first training underscore data points for our training set and print the shapes to confirm the modifications. This process ensures randomness and diversity in our training data set, contributing to the robustness of our machine learning model. Now, we move on to splitting our data into training and validation sets. We set the train and validation split ratio to 0.8, indicating that 80% of the data will be used for training and 20% for validation. Following that, we generate an array of indices for shuffling, similar to what we did before. We shuffle these indices randomly to introduce variability. Next, we split the indices into training and validation sets based on our defined ratio. Using these selected indices, we create our training, x underscore train and y underscore train, and validation sets, x underscore val and y underscore val. Finally, we print the shapes of these sets, providing a quick overview of the dimensions to ensure the split was successful. This division allows us to assess the performance of our model on unseen data during the training process, ensuring generalization and effectiveness. Ensuring that our data is on a consistent scale is crucial for the performance of many machine learning algorithms. In this snippet, we employ min-max scaling to bring our data within a specific range. We initialize a min-max scaler using the preprocessing.minmaxscaler.fit. This scaler is then fitted to our training data. Subsequently, we transform both our training and validation data using the fitted scaler, ensuring that both datasets are now on the same scale. Finally, we print the maximum and minimum values after scaling. This step provides insights into the scaling process, confirming that our data now falls within a standardized range. We appreciate you joining us on this geospatial data analysis journey. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more exciting content. You can find the code example on our GitHub page. Stay curious, and we'll see you in the next video, where we'll learn about the model selection and training.